the important thing for you students to remember for your lives that are way ahead of you are two things. The first thing is do not take anything for granted. And the second thing is Sometimes in your lives, things are going to happen that are unexpected. And you have to deal with it. In 1938, I was 14 years old. And I started high school. It was my first year. I was born in the city of Vienna, in Austria. And until that time, I lived in peace with my mother and father, in tranquility. We had everything that anybody would want to have. We had freedom of speech, of religion, of thought. We could say whatever we wanted to say because we were living in a democracy in Austria, which is a little country centered in Middle Europe. And the Austrians took a great amount of pride in their culture. They took a great amount of pride in their musicians, in their composers, in their poets, in their writers. Some of the most famous musicians in the world came from Austria. Among those were Johann Strauss, the Walsh King, Ludwig van Beethoven, Franz Schubert, people that wrote music that is heard even today that is being played by the St. Louis Symphony every week. And they took a great amount of pride in this culture that they had. In, in Europe itself. They thought they were the cream of the intellectuals in Middle Europe. Then came 1938, March of 1938. At that time, the German Chancellor, uh, Hitler, had decided he needed more living space for his people. And he had contacted the Austrian Chancellor and asked him to come to Berchtesgaden in Germany to talk about important matters. What he wanted to talk about was he wanted to take over Austria. And he wanted to do it peacefully without having a war, and without anybody getting hurt. The Austrian chancellor came to Berchtesgaden, stayed for three days. He was harangued, shouted at, made feel like a total nothing. And he was given a choice. You either step down or my troops are gonna come into Austria and we're gonna have a bloodbath. Strange as it seems, two weeks before all this happened, the Austrian chancellor uh, called for a semi-election where all the people had to vote for was, one, we would like to have Austria stay free, and two, no, we would like to join Germany and become part of Germany. And 99.7 of all the people that voted, voted for independence. Well, things change. Things change. Immediately after Hitler went into Austria in total triumph. All those people that voted for independence had a change of heart and welcomed the German troops and Austria became part of Germany. And I was there on the Ringstrasse in, in Vienna when Hitler and his troops marched in in triumph. 
I was a kid, my hair was blonde, my eyes are blue. I didn't look like anybody else, so a good friend of mine and I went down to watch Hitler come in. I guess when his car passed us, I must have been here to about half the size down the room when his car passed us by. And so things changed very drastically. And that's where the thought about don't take anything for granted comes in. Because three days afterwards, we went to school, went back to school. And uh, being first year uh, high schoolers, one of our languages that was required to be learned was English. We had uh, gone to a school that was semi-Catholic, so every, every uh, schoolroom had a crucifix above the teacher's desk. <clears throat> Our teacher was a young man, about maybe in his middle 30s, always well-dressed, well-spoken. He dressed and looked like we thought an Englishman or an American would dress like. A sport coat, slacks, button-down shirt, rep tie, and in his lapel, he would always have a little button with the Austrian colors, red, white, red. However, on the day that he appeared after Hitler took over the country, nothing had changed about his appearance. Everything was the same. He came to the classroom. It was mandatory for the students to stand up when the teacher came in. The only thing that had changed was his lapel pin. On that day, his lapel pin was a huge swastika, the, the insignia of the Nazis. And he carried a brown package under his right arm. He told us to remain standing. He walked up to his chair and got up on his chair, unwrapped the package, lifted it up, the contents, knocked off the cross, which fell to the ground, and put up what he had held in his hand, a huge picture of Adolf Hitler. And he said to us, look at his face. This is going to be your new God. If you look for us to be saved and to gain power, that is the man that's going to lead us to greater power and make you the master race. Now, we had about one-third of the students in our class. There were 50 students in the class. One-third were Jewish, about one-third were Catholic, and one-third were Protestant. And I had many dear, dear friends in that class who were high schoolers. We looked at each other, kind of bewildered. We never expected that. And then he looked at us, the Jewish students, and said, we want you to get up, pick up your books, and leave. And don't come back here anymore because you are not wanted in this school. You are not wanted in any school. We don't want to teach Jews in an Austrian school. So go home. Son was went down to the principal's office, and he said, yes, I have no choice. You have to leave. And so he did. When I got home, my mom said, well, you have to have someone teach you because you just can't stop going to school. So she hired a tutor. And uh, the tutor and I studied together. First thing, after about five days after that happened, we went to a beautiful city park. With parks are just all over Vienna. And we were going to sit on a bench to start doing some reading. Hey, the benches had signs on them that said, no Jews allowed. No. It really said, no Jews were dogs allowed. Now, I don't know what they had against dogs. 
I love dogs. Since I've been in America, I had five dogs so far. <laughs> I immediately took offense against being hateful to the dogs. But worst of all, being a little serious, I took more offense as to what was written on, on the bench, in, in, in the, on the sign. No Jews allowed. You know, when you're brought up in a country of freedom, in a country that respects your religion, your beliefs, where you can say what you want and speak what you want and listen to what you want. And when you're young, when you're 14 years old, that type of thing that suddenly comes upon you has a terrible effect on your being. Terrible effect. Now, my whole family, there were about 30 of us, my grandparents, my uncles and aunts, my cousins, all were born in Vienna. And we are very close with each other. On a Sunday morning, my grandma on my mother's side would take me down to one of the city parks and say I was just a little kid. It was mandatory that any little boy who had blonde hair would go into City Park dressed in a sailor suit, a blue sailor suit. So I wore a sailor's cap and a blue outfit. And uh, she was just so proud of me. And I was proud of her. But things change. We had a fairly nice house in Vienna. We had a housekeeper who had about three weeks after we were taken over by the Germans, knocked on the door and told my mom to vacate the premises and move out because she was going to take over with her husband and live there. And he was an SA stormtrooper. And we left. After that, that all happened in March. In November, of that year, something occurred all over Germany, which is now known as the Night of the Broken Glass. The ones you've been through the museum heard about that. On that day, the German stormtroops rampaged through the city of Vienna and burned all the synagogues and temples, took the clergyman and the rabbi's prisoner, marched them through the streets, and finally marched them to the, what was known as, laughingly, as the beautiful Blue Danube, threw them in and drowned them. On that day alone, about 40 to 50,000 Jewish men and boys were killed in Germany and Austria. And things get worse from now on. And you say to yourself, well, how much worse can it get? It get a lot worse. Because our family disappeared one by one, two by two, and they were gone. Everybody knew that the Germans had established concentration camps. And we just assumed that's where they had been sent to, but we never heard from it anymore. So that by the time 1939 came along the following year, the only ones that were left were my father, my mother, and myself, and uncle and aunt and their son. And the six of us were the only ones that were able to get out of Germany and escape. Now, I come to this point. I had a terrible, terrible guilt feeling in my heart through many, many years because our whole family perished in the Holocaust. And I questioned God and I said, Dear Lord, why did you save me? I was no different than anybody else. 
My mother and father were no different. My uncle and aunt, my cousin. Why did you save us? And that thought stayed with me for many, many more years. And yet, all I thought about when I was your age, and after my family was killed and disappeared, the term that we use today is known as payback. How can I pay back for the loss of 28 to 30 people? We were lucky because we had relatives in St. Louis who uh, vouched for us so that we would not be a burden on the American people or the American government. And they brought us across and we landed in New York eight days before the Germans invaded Poland. If we had remained in Germany for eight more days, you wouldn't have me talk to you here today because I'd be dead too. So eight days was a big difference. And so we landed in New York and we came to St. Louis. I entered high school here. I went to McKinley High School, graduated from there. The thought of getting even never left my mind. Never left my mind. After I graduated high school and after I turned 19, the United States went into the war and I enlisted in the American Army and stayed in the Army for four years. It's kind of interesting how things turn. Kind of interesting how your life continues. I was trained to be in a military police escort company. And what our job was, was to go across and get prisoners of war, German prisoners and Italian prisoners, and bring them back to the United States and put them in prison camps. It was my job. At one time, during World War II, we had close to 400,000 German prisoners in different camps in the United States. That's how things turned for me. I was given a job with the Army with an outfit called the OSS, which stands for Office of Strategic Services, and was placed into a prisoner war camp where we had the job to seek out German war criminals. We caught some. But all of a sudden, from being the hunted, I became the hunter. These guys were not pleasant people. They were SS, black-shirted stormtroopers. They hated everybody. And they were scared to death that they might get killed by us. But we, should, no, we never touched anybody. Never hurt anybody. Because we're not that kind of country. We're not that kind of people. Don't take anything for granted. Because when the worm turned, and I was an adjutant to the camp commander, these prisoners, these Germans, these Nazis were scared to death of us. And finally came a day when the war was over and we received orders to seek out about 10,000 of those 400,000 prisoners to send them back to Germany to start a democratic government.
Well, it's kind of interesting how that all developed because we were sent to a camp in Virginia by the name of Fort Eustis, Virginia. And that's where they brought all these prisoners to be interviewed because the Russians who lost 40 million people in the war wanted 90% of the Germans to be sent there. The French wanted 5%, and the remaining 5% went back to Germany. So I was sitting in this, in this tent, and prisoners came in to be interviewed, and I no longer wore a uniform, I just wore khaki shirt and khaki pants, and in comes a tall German, about 40 years old, obviously an officer, but he wore prisoner war clothes, you know, a jacket with a POW stencil in the back of his shirt. And he says to me, don't you get up when an officer comes into the tent? Don't you want to salute me? I said to him, no, I don't want to salute you. I don't even want to talk to you. But it's my job to talk to you. I found out he had been a colonel in the SS division called Der Führer, which was the bodyguard regiment of Adolf Hitler himself. And he said to me, you better be nice to me. Because we just heard on the radio in the, in the, in the barracks that your president passed away. It was in 1945. And now you have a new president. He said, President Roosevelt is dead. And now your new president is, his name is Harry Truman. And who is he? Who ever heard of him? Now we're going to win this war. We got weapons of mass destruction. Are familiar with Saddam Hussein? And we got rockets. They can shoot from Germany into the United States, and we're going to win this war. And then I'll be sitting where you're sitting, and you'll be standing where, you, where I'm standing, and I'll pass judgment on you. And I said, Colonel, you know, this all took place talking in German. It's never going to happen. Why not? Why? I'm, I'm ready to go back to Germany now, to, to fight for my fatherland more. I said, well, no, you're not going back to Germany. You're going to go to Russia. Tomorrow morning, there's a ship leaving Newport News, not far from Fort Eustis. And we're going to put you on that ship, and you're going to, to Vladivostok, Russia, and the Russians will take care of you as they see fit. So we see how things turn about. The unexpected happened to me. And I was able to get some feeling of satisfaction for the loss of my people. But as you get older, you start to become more mellow. I will tell you very frankly that I have forgiven the German people and the Austrian people for what they did to my family. Now, I've not forgiven my generation. I can't do that. I can't forgive them. But I hold no grudges, no animosity, no hatred for anybody that came after my generation in Germany or Austria. You know how that happens? As I said, you get older, you become more mellow in your being. Because if you have, harbor hatred in your heart, and it grows and grows, and it gets more severe and more horrible to live with, then the person that you hurt it's just yourself.
being musically inclined. I remember a German composer who came to the United States who composed beautiful music. And one of the songs in that play that he composed was known as a September song. Now you're not going to hear Nelly or NM sing that song. Not even Madonna could sing that song. But other people would sing it of my generation. And I'll just tell you a few of the words in that song. I won't sing it to you because my voice is going to hell. <laughs> Unfortunately. Some of the words in that song go like this. It's a long, long time from May to November. In the, great, in the days grow short when you reach December. Well, I'm now in the December of my years. My days are growing short too. However, I should tell you that people say that we are the greatest generation of all times that lived in the United States. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that you who are now growing up, eventually some of you will go to college and you go out in the world, your brothers and sisters, your family, your friends, your parents, you can be the greatest generation. Because you, you have the knowledge, you have the background and the education to be just that. And so that we understand each other. Let me also say this. All of us have been given a heart by the good Lord. And what we do with that heart is up to each of us. You can have a good heart and be good to your friends and to people that you go to school with and play with and are with and are with. Or you can do otherwise and assume hatred, dislikes, and become bigots. We took an oath. that in effect said that we would never let this happen again. Never again. Although I must confess, unfortunately, it has happened again many times since World War II. But we have to persevere and do what we can to keep our promise, to fight against injustice, against intolerance, against bigotism, because no matter what you are, whether you're black or white, whether you're Chinese or any nationality, we're all children of God. And God has also furnished us with a soul. We Jews believe that when we die, that soul returns to God. And when you reach, hopefully, the heaven, judgment will be passed on you as to how you lived your lives. Now, I know, I know that you have an interest in coming here because you wouldn't be otherwise. Please take with you, take with you in your body, in your heart, the lessons you've been taught here today. Please be good and decent to your friends, to strangers that you meet. Show some consideration and kindness to them. 
And remember that on January 29th, 2007, some old guy talked to you and told you all these things. Of course, I haven't told you everything. I don't want to tell you everything. But let me also add one more thing. This is the greatest country in the world. I was a poor immigrant, a boy that had nothing. After I came back, after the army, I went to and graduated from Washington University, went to law school there, and I practiced law in St. Louis for 53 years. And God has really blessed me. I have two sons who are lawyers, not practicing, they took over my practice, and we have five grandchildren. And the oldest grandchild is now a second year student at Washington University Law School. So the legend continues. I hope it does for me for a few more years anyhow. I want to leave a little time for you to ask me questions. Certain things, I, I, my hearing is going bad too, so you're going to have to speak up, please. And I want to thank you for your attention and for your patience, and I wish you well in your school. Thanks a lot. My name is Walter Gelber. I was born in February of 1924 in the city of Vienna, Austria. I have family here in St. Louis, consisting of my wife, married for 54 years, and we have three children two sons and a daughter. My sons are taking care of what used to be my law practice, and they're practicing law in St. Louis County. Our daughter, who is the eldest, is married to a doctor in Little Rock, Arkansas. We have five grandchildren. The oldest is now a sophomore at the law school at Washington University in St. Louis, where I graduated from in 1950. The other two, her, her sister and brother, go to Wisconsin. He's graduating this spring. And the youngest one goes to the University of Arkansas when she just started. We have two little grand grandsons, Simon and Nathaniel, who are 10 and 8 years old. And there are the sons of my, my son, Brian. I've had, I'd have to say, a very satisfying and very interesting and very blessed life. In two weeks, I'll hopefully hit 83. And my wife and I have done everything anybody could do. We've been all over the world, including every country you can imagine, excepting we haven't been to Russia or India. But we've been every place else, sometimes two or three times. In my practice of law, when I graduated in 1950, we only had 28 students. And they were all WW2 veterans. I think of those students only one or two are left practicing law. The rest of them have retired or unfortunately have gone. But from our class of 28, we, we produced five judges, one federal judge, and in the class before us, one of the graduates was the director of the FBI and the CIA, an extremely nice person. In my experience as a lawyer and as a citizen, I've had the opportunity to meet on occasions with the ex-chancellor of Austria, who is now gone, his name was Shushnik, and he and I had talked to each other a couple of times at the World Union meetings. I also had the occasion to meet Henry Kissinger, to whom I talked briefly at a dinner that we gave for him. No, not we, but 
temple Israel gave for him. And I've met so many interesting people in my lifetime. The, vi the Vice Chancellor of Austria, what did you say to him? i tell you what I said to him. He was a nice man. He was a Chancellor, actually, Kurt von Schirschnig. He was taken prisoner by Hitler and put into a concentration camp where he met a lady who was a countess, and he married her. And then he moved to St. Louis and became a professor of history in poli sci at St. Louis U. When I first met him, he was very amiable. He was friendly. I recall his regime. He was not totally democratic. I'd have to say, in all honesty, he was probably semi-fascist. But as I spoke to him, he extended his right hand to me to shake my hand. And I said to him, Dr. Shushnik, I can't shake that hand. He says, why not? Because it's the hand that shook the hand of Adolf Hitler. I can't bring myself to do that. So other than shaking hands, we can be friends. But I don't ask you to do that again. And he told me a story about how he was unjustly thrown out of office. But in Austria, it was really not a totally true democracy as we know it in the United States. It was His predecessor, whose name was Dolfus, Dolfus had been chancellor in 1934. I was 10 years old. And uh, there had been an attack on the chancellery by, by Nazis, and they went ahead and killed him. And I have to say, in all honesty, if I have to be totally blunt, that the Austrians themselves, by and large, were not overly friendly to the Jewish people. I can recall one example. There happened to be an Austrian soccer team in Vienna. The name was Hakoa. I don't ask me what the name stands for, I don't remember. But they would play in the first league, you know, like, like we have the baseball teams playing in the National League and in, in, in American League. They would be in the first league. And they were at Sunday games, and the team consisted of all Jewish players. And more often than not, riots broke out at the stadium, which held 60,000 people, when the Jewish team won a, won a game occasionally, you see. So there was never too much liking of the Jews. Because we had 200,000 Jews in Vienna. And after the... Uh, annexation of the country into Germany. Uh, some were lucky enough to be able to leave, as my family was. Some went to Shanghai. Some went to South America. Some, they had a, there was a rumor going around that the French were going to give up Madagascar to make a Jewish state there, but it never happened. And it was extremely difficult for Austrian Jews and German Jews to get into the United States. The example, of course, is the steamship St. Louis, which was crammed with refugees, which had docked in Havana, and they refused to let the people off the ship at that time. The, Havana, the uh, Cuban dictator wouldn't let them come in. And then the tragic thing that happened was they were then brought to the United States. And the American Jewish Committee asked President Roosevelt to admit them, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He said, commentary, I know. And then he went back to Germany, and Roosevelt got killed. Um, start with your life before. Okay. My father was an executive with a big insurance company in Vienna. 
he uh, was the director of the Phoenix Insurance Company, who was headquartered in Brazil. And he, he enjoyed a good life. Uh, there was a good life. It was a good life. My mom, God rest her soul, was uh, a lady of the world. She had the, her regular bridge games at my aunt's coffee house in the 7th district. My aunt Rose had a coffee house there. And uh, she looked upon me as her, her, her liebling, her darling. Nothing, nothing was enough. She couldn't do, couldn't do enough for me. Of course, the problem was that I was addicted to eating hot dogs. I was a hot dog fiend. As some people are addicted to cocaine, my addiction was strictly hot dogs of any size, any sort. So every time I went to a coffee house and my mother was playing bridge, I sat in the corner and kept on reading magazines and eating hot dogs till I came out of here. But I loved it. For talk about that, I, I was a, you know, apparently I must have been a likable kid. I was blonde, I was little, curled, curly hair. I, when I wore that, that uh, outfit, a sailor outfit, walking with my grandma, she held my hand. And she was the old type Jewish person. Uh, I was a pride and joy. If you want to, have you been to Vienna? So you had fun, I have, it's beautiful. So any, in any event, so we walked, went to the Stadtpark and he, I'm holding on to her hand and she's holding on to me. And I got this cute little hat, a sailor hat with a little ribbons cut on the back. And the Gentile people would walk, stop and said, look, it's the Chris Kindle. It's a little Christ. Well, my grandmother was very superstitious. As soon as they uh, left the scene and got out of view, she immediately took off my cap and spit on my forehead to drive away the evil spirits. <laughs> Sound familiar? I had the wettest forehead in Vienna. <laughs> but we had a loving and wonderful close family uh, relationship with my aunt on my mother's side. Not so much on my father's side. Uh, my father was more reserved. He, um, unfortunately, uh, had some arrogance, which I had promised myself that if I ever get married, I would not have the same attitude of arrogance towards my children, because I was an only child, as was my cousin, who lived in New York, who got married uh, to a um, French girl in, uh, after the war was over. And she came over here, nice, nice person, Jack, Jackie. And um, he had a much better relationship with, with his father than I with mine. I gotta be honest with you, my relationship was not that great. But my relationship with my mother was, I just adored her. And everybody loved her, everybody. She was just one of a kind. And I'd like to say it to you, I mean, so lucky to have met my wife, who has stuck with me through thick and thin. We had good times. We never had bad times, excepting about 10 years ago I became ill. I mean, it seemed like everything that could happen to a person happened to me. I had a clear blue sky, I found out that I had colon cancer. I was at home getting ready to go and swim in my pool and the doctor told me that I have to go in and see somebody. And he recommended the doctor, who would be, you probably know, Ira Codner, who is a great doctor. When I met him the first time, I had a reputation of wanting to sue people. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. That was my, my, my job. But I never took a case that I didn't find justified. Never. Ever. But I had this sense of humor. And I walked in his office, I'm scared to death. And he says to me, oh, I heard of you. You're the lawyer that sues doctors. I said, I'm not going to see you if you take my case. I'm not going to do that. Although the year before, or two years before, 
I had the biggest judgment that any lawyer ever had against Jewish hospital with $1 million. There was a lot of money then. So Iris said, well, I'll take care of you. And he did. He, he saved me. He saved me. Do you, do you think that the fact that your mother did love you so much, that you had all that, did, did, um, did, did that help you find your way back to some forgiveness for what had happened? Yes. Yes, it definitely has. I adored my mother, and she adored me. She was just, uh, of course, she knew my children, two of my children. She, my mother passed away in 1970 of a heart attack. And was, how were your parents? Did your, were your parents angry uh, about? My father was so arrogant, so arrogant, that when we came to the United States and landed in New York, after we got off the ship, a highest representative walked up and gave my father $51 bills. That's your start in being in your new country. That's all we had, $50. And then we went into Manhattan, and we spent the summertime. It was, um, yeah, of course. It was late August, September. The war hadn't started yet, last week before the war started. And it was hot as all heck in New York. And we stayed at some horrible hotel off Broadway. I don't like to use terms to describe it, but it was not good. Walked on the street, down the street to get some air, because there was no air conditioning then. There were people sleeping on the street, not in not in in, in cubbies or in in uh, in little. Side, sideways from, from businesses, but all on the street. My father said, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go back to where I came from. And he meant it. I said, Dad, you go back to where you came from, the first thing he'll do is kill you. But he had that certain arrogance, you see. Well, how, did you, how did you convince them to let you, so you knew after Crystal knocked, that you had to get out. You didn't have a chance. Oh, no crap. And they knew it too, but he was too arrogant to admit it. I mean, we thank God for saving us. Yeah, and the, and the reason you got out was the relative you had. The relatives in St. Louis. Right. And that, that came about because my mom's close friend uh, in Vienna, when she played cards, her name was Rega Silverstein. And she went, when she, cared, when she, she had two boys, and when they left Austria to, to come to St. Louis, they had relatives here too. Unfortunately, her youngest son got sick and passed away in Poland on the way to the United States. And uh, as it turned out, they were the nicest people. And she went to see the, the mother of the person who was going to vouch for us and begged her, begged her to vouch for us and bring us over here. And she was just the nicest person. And I went. So, did you talk to your grandparents? What, did you, were you able to say goodbye to your grandparents? No. They disappeared. So, they had all disappeared before. They all you got disappeared. Out. Didn't know what happened to them. Well, I know one of my uncles, my aunt Rose's husband, whose name happened to have was Adolf. Uh, he died at a younger age, and he was buried in a huge Vienna Central Cemetery. It takes acres and acres of land. And uh, so, uh, no, I never talked to anybody, excepting my uncle and aunt who moved to New York. And their son, extremely intelligent, and I told you this, and very, very of tremendous ability, uh, became the secretary of the United Nations. They call him secretary, he was like a minister, and, got, and when it was sent to South America. Okay, so take me back to your, uh, you're 14 years old, your life is wonderful. Yeah. And you go to school and everything. All right. Changes. Life is not only wonderful. We had a beautiful home. We had servants. My father had a limousine. My dad wasn't around that much. He had other interests. I never forgave that. Never forgave that. He, um, he was not a family man. But as I said earlier, I swore that 
if I would have the chance, I'd be different. And I have been different. And why do I do this now? Let's get into this speaking thing. When I was in the hospital 10, 12 years ago with colon cancer, not just one thing, and so many other things happened to me. You know, it's a funny thing. When you lay there in a the hospital room by yourself, you're like Tevye. You start a conversation with God. First you say to God, why me? Why is this all happening to me? After all, you saved me from the destruction, and now look, I'm sick. I beg you, let me live out of this, and I'll do something that will be good for my people. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this speaking now. If not the only reason that I come back here to speak. Because I feel I owe it to God for saving me. Since the time there were many other illnesses, uh, which are too many to mention, I had four hip replacements. And I walk with this silly walker, but hey, I know that it is, it is about survivor's guilt. I, I'm, I know it is. But I'll tell you something. I always felt that my glass has always been half full and not half empty. I've had too many wonderful things happen to me. Too many good things happen to me. To feel otherwise. But now, when I was 14, yes, we had everything. Everything you could imagine. Never thought of ever having to leave Austria. Because everything we had, we, we, I mean, we took vacations in Hungary, took vacations in Bad Gastein in, 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 in Tyrol, had a little place in, in, in Hungary where we stayed, my mother and I and her friends. And uh, it was just marvelous. And all of a sudden, it's all gone. That's why I started by saying, things change. Things change, and sometimes they change quickly. And I'll tell you, I don't talk about what's happening now in the United States. I have my own feelings about it, but I don't talk about what the administration is doing with Iraq. I feel this way. I don't have to relate it to other people. That's not part of the reason I'm over here. But we're living in a country which is beset the great dangers we have in this country, the lunatic fringe. And don't you ever think there isn't any, the, the lunatic fringe. And unfortunately, some of those folks live in Missouri, right around Lake of the Ozarks, that area. And they're total Jew haters, completely. And when I said it could happen anytime, anywhere, don't take anything for granted. It could happen here. And best be on guard to not let it happen. I'll give another example. Now you got me going. Okay. Uh, take the case of President Carter. President Carter, up to about four weeks ago, acted like he was a good friend of the state of Israel. Everything that should be done to keep those people going and to keep the state independent, he was for that. Now he's done a complete 360 degree turnabout. Now he compares the Israeli, Israelis to, uh, to, to, to apartheid, apartheid Did you people. Did Alan Dershowitz wrote about him? No, I haven't seen that yet. I'm going to send it to you. Now he's talking about apartheid. He puts the Israelis into the position of the South Africans, and you know, not, and this man did a complete turnaround. So what am I saying? I'm saying that it's not inconceivable that this thing couldn't happen somewhere here in the United States. It's scary. Now I know I won't be alive. I won't be alive to God forbid see it, but it's scary to think it could happen. Why do you think the Austrians opened their arms to, Germ to the Germans, to the Nazis? Because inwardly, two reasons. The first reason is 
that the Austrians never in the history of their country ever won a war. The only war they ever won, if you can say it was a, it was a, a victory, was when the Turks invaded Austria in 1673. And they had a hero, the Austrian here, Count von Starnberg and Prince Eugene, who defeated the Turks at the gates of Vienna. They never won a war since. But when Hitler came to power in 1933, he was the complete demagogue. First of all, he blamed everything on the Jews. Everything. Secondly, from the very beginning, he was hell-bent on world power. And when he talked about he needed more Lebensraum, more living space for um, the Germans, the first place he had in mind was Austria, because that's where he was born. And what did he do after he occupied Austria? Immediately after he occupied Austria, he changed the name of the country, just like the Romans used to do when they occupied territories. He changed the name of Austria to Ostmark, Eastern region, just like the Roman Caesar used to do. And then he needed the Sudetenland, and then he needed Czechoslovakia, and then, of course, uh, Poland, and that was the end of it. But when my wife and I went back to Vienna, we went, and we went to um, show you how the things hadn't changed. We went back to Vienna three or four times. One time we went about 1900, gosh, in the 70s. Had some friends with us. We wanted to go Friday night. You become very, very pious when you leave the country. All of a sudden, you got to go to Friday night Shabbat services, like you're on a steamship. Uh, you never dreamt about going to services, but on a steamship, you got to go. So we looked for a synagogue, and there was one beautiful synagogue in Vienna. In the uh, name of the street was Judengasse, Jew Street. We walked up in the inner city, first district. We walked up to the door, and there's a car there and three men. And so I asked, of course, I could speak fluent German. I asked one of these, said, are you a police officer? Yes, what are we doing here? We have a, a warning that the neo-Nazis might attack the synagogue tonight and throw a bomb into it. And this is 1975 or 1976. So they never changed, basically. And anti-Semitism is still rampant in Austria. Well, did you feel it as a young child before? When did you start feeling it? I never felt it as a young child. So I left and until, they, and, until they annexed the country into Germany. Uh, I had good Gentile friends. I had a, you'll see, um, did you look through those pictures yet? I, I, you know, I found a copy of my the Mitzvah invitation. Maybe you like that. Um, I had a big Bar Mitzvah. And although my parents were not overly religious, although my, my mother kept a kosher house, but she was not overly religious. religious. My father was not at all. But he was the kind of a guy I liked to put on the airs, you see. And all his uh, society friends and all that. That never appealed to me. Although now that I had some reasonable success as a lawyer, uh, I was, I'm probably doing much better than he ever did. But I don't put it on my shoulder. What I have, I have. What I don't have, I don't have. So, so it wasn't until you were in school that all of a sudden, when the teacher came in, that was, that was your first... That was it. That was it. First, get, I get out. Well, uh, it happened the way I explained it. Uh, got into English class, and he said, well, no. He put up the picture of Hitler on the wall and knocked down the cross and told the Jewish students to leave, which we did. And I uh, had to be home, I had to get a tutor to, to help me with my studies. And so... Did it frighten you? Did you? Yes. Yes, it did. It's kind of strange you mentioned that. There were certain groups in Vienna of young people in 1938 who were being trained to join... Excuse me. To be being trained to be brought into Palestine and to join the Haganah as, as, as fighters. So we went through some basic things. We had no guns or anything like that, they wouldn't, wouldn't things. 
And they trained us in, in, in the thought that we would be going to Palestine uh, to, to create a Jewish state in 1938. It wasn't until 10 years thereafter that the Jewish state was created, you see. So I joined some of those groups. And then uh, this friend I told you about, I told the group about Carl Morgan Road, who is now 83, going to be 83. He's two, he's, he's two months younger than I am. Uh, we were very close. He lost his family in Germany. He came by himself to Austria to seek refuge, and we, my parents took him in. And he had a brother who's still alive. He, his brother lives in Ecuador. He comes to visit him. The nicest guy in the world. And uh, he, was, he was right there in, in, on the front constantly. I was not. So, so you, you actually did know it was happening, and, and so it was a sharp period of time though before you knew and, and you left. Well, let me say this but to, to set the record straight. Everybody knew what was happening. Everybody had heard rumors. Uh, everybody knew there was a concentration camp named Dachau. Uh, nobody seemed to know that they had about several hundred other concentration camps, Bergen-Belsen and the other ones, Auschwitz or whatever. But Dachau, at the time before we left Austria, was the concentration camp of choice. And once the people were taken there, or left the city, you never saw them again, because they killed them. They killed them. So, tell me what it felt like to get on the ship. You, you've got the... the an, interest, an interesting experience. Something you didn't expect. We got the papers. We, everything was taken from us, of course. We expected that, everything. My father uh, was the copying cat of the Hollywood actor Adolf Manjou, a very a dilettante, cavalier-like attitude, dressed to the teeth. So he decided he's going, to, he's going to pack one suitcase with 40 pair of shoes, 40 pair all individually packed, wrapped in socks. So we're on the, on the dock at Hamburg, getting ready to, to board the ship. And, 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 and the uh, boarder SS officer saw the suitcase. And he said to my father, what's in there? My father said, my shoes. And the guy went berserk. He went, so, he went nuts. You mean to tell me that you get shoes in that suitcase? Is all you got? Look for yourself. You open it up. Forty pair of shoes. It was embarrassing. But the SS officer had to, had, to, had one one more time at this guy. He saw my father's gold watch. He said, "Give me a watch." He gave it to him. Now, see, the memory comes back. I'll tell you something else. I didn't tell these people. I didn't want to talk about that. Since my father was such a big wheel in the insurance industry, they were looking for him. So he decided to get on a train and try and get into Switzerland. He got to the border where the German Border police captured him and put him in prison in, 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 at Basel, Switzerland, the German border with Switzerland. Now, my father was a good-looking guy, you know, blonde hair, looked like what they call an Aryan. And my mom was blonde, too, natural blonde. So here by myself and my mother, I said, she said, I have to go and get your father out of, out of prison. Yeah, they're going to get him out of prison. He's, he's a prisoner at the border. He'll probably be sent to a concentration camp next. That might scare you, but there's just no way you're going to do that. She got on a train. It's almost like a movie that would be directed by Arthur Preminger. Got on a train, got off at the border, 
went to the border police station, talked to the captain in charge about why she's there. And he apparently he was so taken by this, of this whole thing, he let my father lose. And um, my father apparently called somebody in Basel at the, uh, uh, they used to, the term was Kultusgemeinde, a German, uh, a Jewish uh, society. It was the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Oh, was that true? No, not Rosh Hashanah, I'm sorry. Eve of, eve of Pesach. And two people from the Jewish community in Basel met him, took him to the home of one of the members who was sitting at the Seder table dressed in black tie and tails, or white tie and tails, black tie with tuxedos. And then came the real, the real fiasco. We got the affidavits to, to come to the United States. But bureaucracy and red tape demanded that he, that he had to leave from Austria. He couldn't leave from Switzerland. So what did he do? He took a train back into Vienna where if they would have caught him, they would have killed him right on the spot. And he got safely to, to the apartment where we had because we had to give up a house. And then we had the papers from the American General Council because the embassy was gone. And that's how we got out. Now, finally. So you got me going. I remember how I know you love it. Finally. Now you would think that a Jewish family leaving Germany on a German ship would be treated with disdain and would be treated badly. Contraire. Totally to the contrary. We were treated just like any other passenger. Uh, we took our meals in the dining room. We even attended the carnival ball that they gave at, at, at the German ship. And this ship was part of another line that owned a bigger ship called the Bremen, a larger ship. And the rumor was that if the Bremen would not overtake the Hamburg after two and a half days at sea, the Hamburg would turn back and go back to port to Germany. And everybody thought, well, apparently something's going to happen in two and a half days, which it did. Uh, Italy invaded Poland. So we got to New York. So we went on, because the Bremen overtook us after two and a half days. We got back to New York. We got into New York two days, three days before Hitler invaded Poland. If we had stayed just another, another week, you would never hear this wonderful story that I'm telling you today. So I've, I can, you know, I... It's luck. Do you feel a lot of it is luck? A lot of luck. A lot of muzzle. A lot of luck. And when I said earlier that I have these thoughts of guilt, why did you save me, God? Why did you let me have this wonderful family? What's the reason? But God always has a reason. I don't understand the reason. I'm not that wonderful a person. But there must have been a reason. And I've opened myself up completely to you. You are waiting to let me cut loose. And I know nothing else to tell you, excepting that I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to have done what I've done. Absolutely. Okay, well then just tell me, I, I know that um, you talk to God, but also part of that is coming in and talking to these kids. So when you talk to the kids, what does that do for you? It gives me peace. It gives me peace. It gives me a chance to share my story to some extent with other people. Because I never talk about these things at home. I never talk about these things at home. It's something that's just inside of me. It can't get out. But I can do it here to some extent. It gives me peace. And when you look, when you look out at these children, what do you think? I think that I think that some of them are quite impassive. 
I don't feel that I'm really getting through to them. Maybe one or two. But I can't blame them because when they get through this small museum we have here, uh, they want to get out of here. You see all this killing and all these bodies and all this, uh, all these horrors. They don't want to listen to some guy telling them how wonderful it was, which it wasn't. But uh, I don't try and impress them with the wonderful life I had of the young man, young boy, because they might think, they might become envious and say, look at this guy, he really had a good life. Why should, we as far as, why should we feel sorry for him? I don't want to feel sorry for me. I just want to get out this message that it could happen again. And I'm, I'm sincere about this. It could happen again. It could happen again. Which, which is why it's important that we have you speaking, have yes. the museum. Yes. So tell me that. Tell me that you feel that it is important. Well, it is. It's to the point, though, as I speak to you now, I'm almost sorry that I told the secretary that I'd rather talk to 11th and 12th graders than to 8th graders. It doesn't make any difference how old they are. If you can get one, one child, one young person, to listen to you, and have an impression about what you said. That's all we expect. One. That's all we want. All we want. Just one to, to listen and to understand. And I'm always ready to go down to say, Betty, Betty, give me some more eighth graders. Because, I mean, it gives you purpose for being here, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But when I leave here, my dear, and I go home, uh, I'm upset, and I, about what happened. I, it all comes back. It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult um, to tell your story. You know, I, Larry videotapes a lot of bar mitzvahs. You're saying we've got a bar mitzvah picture. Tell me about your bar mitzvah. I don't remember much about it, excepting strange. It comes back. I was laying in bed before my bar mitzvah. Uh, was to take place, and uh, since I've always been a romantic by nature, I started to compose a little poem to myself. It started out like something, you're now going to turn 13, my dear child, and you'll be a man. And we had a bar in a beautiful temple in the second district. And there was, uh, a lot of people, I don't remember who was there, of course, I can't remember then. But even then, the, the tradition existed of uh, overloading the Bar Mitzvah boy with fountain pens. That hasn't changed. <laughs> but uh, we had, you know, our boys became Bar Mitzvah, both Brian and Steve. And uh, our daughter was confirmed, T.I. But you see, Brian, my oldest, oldest son, is going to uh, send his oldest boy, Nathaniel, to Hebrew school. He belongs to the Reformed Temple. And he told me the other day he's going to study to, to be a Bar Mitzvah. But my daughter's kids have not done any of this. She well, may, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What is, what, as far as religion, how did that play a part in, in your life? How did, how did it change? Religion? Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed for me because I have had the inner feeling. Now, this might sound really tacky to you or cheesy or whatever you want to call it. And I this is a sincere feeling that you don't have to go to a synagogue or a temple to be with God. God is everywhere you are. God is in this room right now. God is going to walk out of here and go, try and go down the steps. If I make it to the car and don't break my neck, God has saved me. I am the believer that God is everywhere that you are. That's what I'll tell you that I have no fear of death. None whatsoever. Not because we've done everything that anybody humanly could do, but because I know that if I should die. I'm going to a better place. And tell me about 
your grandmother, because I know maybe you'll see your grandmother. You told me what a special, how it makes you so sad to think about her. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if I could see it in heaven. But uh, it's the old feeling that all humans have. You just want to have another year, and then another year, and then another year. Uh, because we're not certain what's on the other side. We think we know, but we're not certain. Because it was taken away from you. Yeah. I mean, tell me how that felt to, to know when, when your grandparents were taken away. It was a feeling of total emptiness. A feeling of creating such a void in your life. My grandparents gone, and my aunt, and my uncles, and whatnot. Um, a total, a total feeling of emptiness, when nothing else matters anymore. But then, as I got my own family going, and I told you earlier, I mean, I'm just so blessed with Mickey, because she's really taken good care of me. I mean, I've been pretty ill the last 10, 10 years or so. But she, and, you know, she's the kind of person and I'm not saying that with uh, any particular feeling of trying to impress you, but she could have anything that she wants, anything. And she never has asked for anything, never asked for anything. That's good. So you know, I'm a lucky guy. Bless, you're a lucky guy. Um, tell me when you did sit on the park bench and it said no Jews allowed. You were saying, I like what you were saying to the kids about being that young age and angry at that age. It, 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 it's a terrible thing that you feel. You feel alienated. You feel disowned. You feel prejudiced against. You suddenly feel that you're not a member of the human race anymore. You're subhuman. And since I was brought up in a home that had a parent who was extremely arrogant and proud, some of that got into me too, but not to the extent where I could live myself. But it was uh, devastating. Devastating. And, and that, I know, fueled some of your um, anger and wanting revenge. Um, tell me about that. Well. What I wanted to do is get even. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know if I could ever do it. I never hurt anybody in the army. Never got into combat. But by some strange way, I was put in a position where I could pass judgment on who goes where and who doesn't go where. So I had uh, about 200 others. I had uh, the ability to choose who goes back to Germany and who goes to Russia and who goes to France. I remember now that I had a uh, major who was part of our command. He was a Harvard professor in civil civilian life. And I asked him that same question. I said to him, I just have these horrible feelings that I was saved for no good reason. He said to me, Walter, you now have a job to do. And I'll quote you a certain phrase he said to me. Ours is but to do or die. Ours is not the reason why. So don't even ask that question. Just do your job. So that's what I've done. And how wonderful that you were able to get into the United States Army and do that. Oh, I was the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do it. I just came, it just came out of the clear blue sky. I never expected to be able to serve like that. And I did. It took me, I was, you know, I had spoke a couple of languages and uh, that helped. But I was never vindictive to the Germans. I wasn't friendly either, but I was not vindictive. But serving in the U.S. Army gave you that opportunity. Tell me, tell me how serving in the U.S. Army gave you that opportunity. Well, it's simply this. They were looking for um, 
students of history, and I always loved history. They were looking for people who could speak German fluently and, of course, English fluently. And they had that. And um, I had never imagined they would create a, a section of the OSS that was going to um, have the job of choosing which of those prisoners was going to go back to Germany and who was going to some other place. That's where I was hunting war criminals. So from the time I was being hunted as a Jew, three years later on, I'm hunting the Nazis. I can't tell you the feeling that you have inside of you to be able to do that. It was a marvelous feeling. About uh, 10 years or 12 years after the war was over, and, and, um, I, I, one of my friends was the German uh, counsel in, in, in St. Louis. And she had called me up and said, would you mind, I, I know I can bring, I want to bring back about 10 or 12 German prisoners of war who went back to Germany and you were, who were confining the camp that you were serving at. Would you speak to them? I said, I don't really want to speak to them. But if you think it'll do you any good as a, as a counsel, I'll meet you at some restaurant, and uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit. So we went down, uh, there's a restaurant in, uh, in Clayton, in, uh, what was the name? The Clayton Inn. And she brought the 10, ten guys there. You know some I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't talk to them. I sat down and spent 10 minutes, and I said to her, Anna, I can't talk to them. I'm sorry. So you're bringing back bad feelings in me. I don't want to do that. So, so you were able to move on, and that's what's important. I was able to make a good life. I was able to do things for my kids, for my wife, that I could have done otherwise. And, I was, and that's pretty much your legacy and the message you would, you would tell your, your kids. If you could say something to your children now, what would you say to them? I would say to them three things. Be true to yourself and keep your beliefs. Be true to your profession and be honest with other people that you deal with. And try and remember your, your dad and your mom. Not because we've done things for you but because you know that I have lived that kind of life as long as you know me. That's what I believe. Okay, would you add anything else to that to your grandchildren? It'd be the same thing. Okay. Um, It'd be the same thing, you know. And, um, I like when you said that the children who leave here today, that you want them to take with them in their body and their heart the lessons that they were taught here today. Yes, I do. I would like that. I believe, okay, that what you did today was a very generous, unselfish thing that you do when you speak. Well. I try. And I believe that you do give part of yourself every time you do it. I do. I really do. Like I told you earlier, when I leave here today, I don't get depressed. Not at all. But the memories come back of my family. It, it's difficult. And I'm hoping that the museum here in St. Louis, I think we're very, it's lucky that we have this museum. Oh yeah, I agree. So that years from now we'll still be teaching these lessons. They've done a good job here, wonderful job. You know, I didn't realize till the other day that Jean Callender, of course you know her story too, I never knew that about her. It's an amazing story. It is, it's wonderful. Yeah, we have a lot of dedicated people here. She's amazing. Away to Judaism, which is interesting. An amazing, amazing story. Um, 
Um, so, let me think if there's anything else um, that I want to ask you. I guess let me just ask you quickly, uh, um, Crystal Knock, do you personally, did you see what was going on during Crystal Knock? Did you just yes. hear it? Yes, I saw some of it. I saw some of the abuse, the physical abuse, where they were hurting Jews out of their homes and making them scrub the sidewalks with tooth toothbrushes and beating the heck out of them. I saw them that. And that was just the beginning, you know, just the beginning. So was that scary for you the night? During, during that at Crystal Knock, you were, how old were you? You were, you know. I'm 14 years old. Yeah, I was scared. Didn't know what to do. Nothing I could do. Nothing I could do. Okay. Um, I think we're good. <laughs>